Alexa has many components um, in the background that make her work. Uh, but the one I work on is the one that decides which part of Alexa should respond to a particular request. Um, so say you ask Alexa, what's the weather today? And on the routing team, which is one of the teams I work on, we help get that question to the weather domain so that you can get the right answer. You're listening to Speaking of Language, a podcast recorded at the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. Each week, we explore a topic related to language pedagogy and second language acquisition. This week on Speaking of Language. Katie Blake tells us how her PhD in linguistics at Cornell led to her work on Amazon's Alexa AI and takes us under the hood of the popular digital assistant. Hello, hello, Speaking of Language listeners. Welcome to a brand new season of our podcast. I'm Angelica Kramer, the director of the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. And I'm Sam Lupowitz, the LRC's media manager. We are excited to speak with Dr. Katie Blake today. Katie is a language data scientist at Amazon Alexa AI. Welcome to Speaking of Language, Katie. Hi, it's great to be here. I'm excited to talk with you guys today. And I wonder how many Alexas just went off in the background as we introduced <laughs> Alexa AI. I had that happen to me the other day over dinner. <laughs> make sure, make sure yeah. to do it six or seven more times over the next. Oh, oh, we will. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens a lot in meetings at work. Um, ah, that is funny. You know, people I often bet. have to mute their mics and say. You know, <laughs> <laughs> not you right now. <laughs> That's funny. Katie, you recently completed your PhD here at Cornell in linguistics, researching phonological marketness effects on noun adjective ordering. Congratulations. And do give us the elevator pitch of your dissertation. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I want to first, I guess, talk a bit about adjective ordering. So for people, um, you know, there are people of all different language backgrounds listening to mm -hmm. this podcast. Um, and it might be the case that in your language, um, the adjective can come before or after the noun, or it can only come in one of those positions. So like in English, adjectives almost always precede the noun, like red car. We don't say car red. Um, but there are some languages where the order has some flexibility and the same adjective can occur before or after the noun. So like in French, you can have maison magnifique or magnifique maison. Um, so there's some flexibility here. And my dissertation, which is now available on ProQuest, mm -hmm. uh, uses large text corpora to see if this flexible conditioning um, is at all, is, if this flexible ordering is at all conditioned by um, trying to avoid uh, dispreferred sequences of sounds together. So, um, so there are a lot of languages that um, don't like the same sound next to each other. So let's say with this English example, car red, we have RR um, and something like that, you know, would be avoided uh, if we had flexibility in English. Um, I looked at vowel hiatus, which is when two vowels occur next to each other, um, stress clash and some other phonological constraints. Um, and I looked at a lot of languages, French, mm. Italian, Polish, Arabic, and Hindi. Awesome. And uh, prior to your PhD, what was your background and path with languages? Oh my God, I was such a language nerd. I loved language <laughs> learning. It was like my favorite subject in school. Um, and I was always, <laughs> I was always pretty good at it, if I can say that. Um, so yeah. I definitely got into linguistics through language learning. Um, mm. A lot of linguists do, not all of them. Um, and yeah, so I, as an American uh, school child, learned Spanish in elementary school, um, as many do. Mm -hmm. And then um, in middle school, I got to pick a language to learn and I wanted to do something different. So I picked French, um, which I continued through high school. And then I got a bachelor's degree in college. Um, and while I was at Indiana University, which is where I did my undergrad, I um, took some more Spanish classes to see how that was going and uh, took Italian for the first time because that was something I always wanted to learn. Mm. Um, and then I actually took a couple of Italian classes during grad school uh, at Cornell. 
um, with Michaela Baraldi, um, who is awesome. So yeah, I love, love language learning and um, hope to yeah continue it throughout my life. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. You are now working as a language data scientist at Amazon Alexa AI. What does your work entail? What do you do? Yeah, this is like, you know, such an exciting question, Um, especially from people from an academic background who maybe don't know too much like what goes on Mm -hmm. uh, out there in the corporate world. Um, But yeah, my work entails helping us at Alexa figure out how well uh, the device is satisfying the customer and where we can do better. So I contribute to this by analyzing data on on interactions with Alexa um, and like doing deep dives to help better understand um, customer pain points like, you know, what might be going wrong, uh, where there's friction. So Alexa has many components um, in the background that make her work. Uh, But the one I work on is the one that decides which part of Alexa should respond to a particular request. Hmm. Um, So say you ask Alexa, what's the weather today? And on the routing team, which is one of the teams I work on, we help get that question to the weather domain so Mm -hmm. that you can get the right answer. Hmm. Fascinating. So how does Alexa learn to respond to those commands and and all the other things that it does what does that look like this is a great question uh there are a couple of ways that alexa learns so um just like in life learning can be implicit or explicit um so Hmm. alexa also learns in kind of these two ways so i'll start with explicit which is more straightforward so you can tell alexa your preferences so they can be included in your routines like Alexa, my favorite football team is the Colts. Um, And so then, you know, when you ask for your daily update or something, um, she can give you the score for your favorite team and that sort of thing. Um, And then sometimes also Alexa asks you for feedback after responding to your inquiry, like, how did I do? Or did I do a good job? Did I get it right? Um, That kind of thing. So we also um, like elicit feedback in that way. And then implicit learning happens through the machine learning that powers Alexa. So machine learning looks at lots of interactions with Alexa and some information about them, like the context and did Alexa succeed or fail at answering um, so that on future requests that maybe haven't been seen yet, uh, the models can make a pretty good prediction at what would be a success or a failure from the customer's perspective. Um, And then another like kind of new newer way that Alexa is learning is through what we call self-learning, which is like we are not, um, you know, giving explicit feedback to Alexa or um, giving it all of the answers where, um, you know, the interaction went well or not. Mm -hmm. She like kind of does some self-supervised learning, like Mm. creating data where probably the interaction was a failure by just like mixing up answers Mm. um, from successful ones um, and that sort of thing. So this is kind of a newer, um, yeah, way of learning that's a Mm. little bit more complicated. Yeah, that's fascinating. Can Alexa teach languages? Uh, Yes. So we um, are always looking for new ways to have Alexa support a variety of language needs from customers all over the world. So Alexa has a feature called Live Translation, which can translate between um, English and French and Spanish and Hmm. Brazilian Portuguese, um, German and Italian. Um, So, yeah, in addition to this live translation thing um, where you can say, Alexa, what's the word for Apple in Spanish? Mm -hmm. Um, She can, um, yeah, she can also do this and, um, yeah, give you give you the the word in the foreign language. And you can also, um, yeah, just go back and forth between many different languages now. Can I teach Alexa to pronounce my name correctly? Uh, yes, I believe that you can. You can tell Alexa what your name is. Um, and this is kind of part of her getting explicit feedback from you. Um, yeah, 
you should try it and let me know I, how it goes. I, I need to because usually um, any interfaces always call me Angelica. And yeah. I've I've tried sometimes to tell them my name is not Angelica. I'm Angelica. <laughs> okay, Angelica. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> I have not I have not tried this with Alexa, so I need to I need to do that when I get home. <laughs> you should. You you guys should you guys should record the interaction and, and put it as like a tag for the podcast or something. Oh, there, oh, there we, we go. go. Please <laughs> do that. I will absolutely edit that on the end. I love how this episode is already turning into everyone listening while we ask for a personal tutorial on how to <laughs> yeah, right? use Alexa better. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, everyone. Um yeah. And does does Alexa also recognize when people switch between languages in context? Yeah, definitely. This is something I I think is so cool. Um, like as a linguist, I know you know that many people that exist. There are so many people in the world that exist in multilingual environments um, with each other, and also just as multilingual people um, and use more than one language and sometimes more than one language in in the same sentence. Um, and so. Alexa has this feature um, called the multilingual model. And with this feature, Alexa customers can switch between um, several supported languages like German, uh, Spanish, French, Italian, and Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, so like if you're at home, you like for the holidays or something with, you know, your nonna, your grandma is over and she's speaking Italian, she can uh, switch between English and Italian. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's really cool. So this may be a silly question, but does Alexa sound different in different languages? Say, you know, if your setting is set to Italian versus English versus German versus whatever. Yeah, this is a really good question, um, but she does sound pretty consistent between the languages and that's kind of on purpose. We want to offer like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like the same customer experience to all, you know, users. Um so, yeah, no matter what language you choose, the default voice kind of sounds similar mm -hmm. um, to maintain this consistency. Um, but there are ways that you can personalize the voice. So you mm -hmm. can make Alexa speak English with like a British or Australian oh, accent. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we we offer like a male sounding voice, um, huh? you know, with a lower F0. <laughs> and there are also a couple like celebrity voices. Um, oh. So there's like, <laughs> there's like uh, Shaquille O'Neal. No, you're um, kidding. <laughs> no, for real. Hey, and, uh, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Samuel L. Jackson, who just has like, nice. an awesome of voice. Course. Of course. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. You guys can have a lot of fun, like, playing with different things after this podcast, I think. Yeah, yeah. clearly. I I, I, I want to have Samuel L. Jackson, actually. Shaq, that's cool, too. But <laughs> it's, just, it's like, right? this is like a th the novelty of it. I feel kind of silly, but it's like back in, like, the pre- smartphone days when people's like i think it was garmin the gps they got mm -hmm. one that that was snoop dog yes. and i was like yes i want snoop dog to tell me to make a left turn <laughs> oh my I, god right i loved like that that was like the first kind of my experience with like voice ai was the garmin and like yeah, yeah. Right. that was yep. so cool and yep. making it like be in a posh like British voice, mm -hmm. and, like exactly. Oh, yeah. God, it's so fancy. Yep. <laughs> yeah, now it's so ubiquitous now. Where you know with yeah, everyone's phones and and devices, but at the time, yeah, that was yeah. <laughs> really that was new and fun. Uh huh. Um, what is the origin of Alexa's name? By the way, why isn't it Katie? I'm so glad it's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, before Amazon launched Alexa as the um, like kind of original wake word, uh, the team that was working on it, of course, like considered lots of different uh, wake words and evaluated them for for different um, different characteristics. So like mm -hmm. one of the great characteristics of Alexa is the like um you know the combination of phonemes that makes it a good um wake word from a speech recognition perspective so like it has a ka and a sa and these are um like big um 
changes in the speech signal that make it mm. kind of easy to pick up huh. um, from like an ASR perspective. And then there were also, you know, internal like beta testing that um, kind of revealed that people definitely preferred using a person's name instead of something like um, computer, um, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is a wake word. Um, but Alexa just feels more personal and natural mm -hmm. um, sure. if you're talking to your sure. assistant. And um, yeah, another uh, like cool fact um, is that uh, Alexa is was kind of chosen to pay homage to the Library of Alexandria. Oh, um, okay. And yeah, and Alexa is kind of like Star Trek brought to life. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of that. Uh, history as well, which is part of why computer is also an available wake word. Uh -huh. um, so yeah. I love it. That's awesome. There's also, I learned recently, um, another wake word that I don't think many people know about is Ziggy. Um, huh. So Ziggy is another, yeah, wake word. Amazon, computer, Alexa, and Ziggy. Okay. Look at Long, that. Ziggy Ziggy is fun and cute, but I am like the next time I'm feeling like I want to be like Starship Captain Jean-Luc Picard, I will address Alexa as computer. I was about to say exactly <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very formal. Engage. Yeah. Yes. And then you have to make sure that she responds in a British accent, though. Yeah, right? I think that's yeah. only fair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The okay. computer on Star Trek was voiced by Gene Roddenberry's wife. This is we're again going way off. <laughs> <laughs> so, Katie, a frequent question that has come up on our podcast recently in season nine and again in season 10 is the issue with which we here at Speaking of Language are most concerned. And that issue is the following. Should our listeners be preparing themselves for the robot uprising? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> my my short answer to this is no, not at all. It's just math. So like, I think it's totally natural and healthy to be skeptical of new technology. This is just being human. Um, but machines are not sentient. They can't think for themselves. Um, it may look like they can think or they're getting like very smart from the outside. Um, and they will definitely continue to get better at the tasks that we point them at. Um, but under the hood, they're really just getting better at statistics. So it's not, um, you know, having feelings in a brain. It's just it's just math down there. Um, really, Got really it. good math. But <laughs> but no. <laughs> this is this is good to hear. I think this will put all of our listeners at ease hearing that from you, Katie. I hope it's reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, Katie, this has been really fun to talk about with you. Where can our listeners find out more about your research and work? Uh, yes, they can go to my website, uh, which is still hosted at Cornell. So I think uh, it's conf.ling.cornell.edu slash Catherine Blake. Um, you can put that in the show notes. <laughs> um, yeah. And I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, so, yeah. Wonderful. Katie, before we sign off, we'd like to ask you to share a word in a language that you speak, you love, you are learning, you want to learn, that makes you laugh. What is that word? So, I learned this word um, just in the last couple of years um, from some very dear, um, great friends of mine who are Korean speakers for their L1. Uh, and Korean is such a cool language. And I know some stuff, but not too much. Uh, but this word is nunchi. <laughs> and uh, I love this word so much because it's like this concept of if a person has good nunchi, they are, they really can like read the room. Um, mm. And they know like what to say when and they really like you know, they kind of have this really good empathy um, and like, just like they don't put their foot in their mouth and they like know when to shut up, um, <laughs> that kind huh. of thing. Um, so this is not something that I 
like this isn't really a word that I have in another language. Um, mm-hmm. But I think like once now that I know it, it like comes up a lot. Yeah. Um, and I, um, I definitely use it a lot with my, with my friends. So nice. yeah. And then she. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for speaking of language with us, Katie. Thank you. It was awesome to be here. Next week, we will speak with Alan van den Arend about Cornell's active learning initiative and how active learning principles can be integrated into language classes. Until then, auf Wiederhören! The Language Resource Center is located on the ground floor of Stimson Hall on Cornell's main campus in Ithaca, New York. Check us out on the web at lrc.cornell.edu or follow Cornell LRC on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Speaking of Language is produced by Angelica Kramer and Sam Lupowitz. Recorded by Sam Lupowitz. Original music by Sam Lupowitz, Dan Gable, and Joe Gibson. Thanks also to the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. As a reminder, the ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Sciences or any other official entity of Cornell University. We thank our listeners, and do stay tuned for our next episode. Alexa. What is my name? I'm talking to Angelica. This is Angelica's account. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's our, our sound bite. <laughs>